years, but this will be a great chance to hear from uh, Ralph, who now works with them and has some really neat insights, not only on the, the bottom trawls and acoustics that we usually hear about, but on some new kinds of technologies for monitoring fish. Or actually, you don't need this. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. Yeah, I've uh, kind of talk about sure. I've been uh, as a fish bi fishery biologist at the Great Lakes Science Center since September of 2020. So, about three years of research under my belt, including leading some of these surveys we'll talk about today. The other two authors here, some of you know, Dave Warner, Chuck Medengin. I tried to add up their experience earlier, and it got a little tough in my head. I don't know, 50 to 60 years. So. I'm happy to answer questions today, but we can always uh, point you to these two via email or other sources if you have anything I can't answer. Uh, so just an overview of today's talk. We'll start with uh, preliminary results from the annual surveys. And this includes both our acoustic survey uh, that's conducted in the summer and the fall bottom trawl. Uh, from there, we'll move on to a review of the spring bottom trawl um, and really just some results and reflections from the last three years of data um, as we've collected those, and this is a survey I've led that's taken on a few iterations over the past couple of years. Um, and finally, our plans as we move forward into 2024. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar, um, one of our annual surveys is the hydroacoustic survey. Uh, this occurs in the summer months and essentially uh, index, indices the uh, fish that are in the water column on Lake Michigan. It provides us information on age uh, zero alewife, which is an uh, index of recruitment, as well as yearling and older alewife, as well as smelt and bloater numbers. Um, so this was completed in August of 2023 this year, or last year, uh, on three different vessels supported by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Mis Michigan DNR, uh, as well as the USGS. So this occurred over uh, what they consider 20 hydroacoustic transects. So surveying approximately 450 kilometers on Lake Michigan. Um, it also included midwater uh, trawls, which essentially uh, every time you see fish, you drop down the net and try to get a species composition associated with that. Um, we also kept 230 alewife for aging. Uh, we do this every year to try to get an uh, age composition uh, from the data. Um, these are still just getting finished up. So we're not going to be able to present on those age data today, but we might be able to talk about them a little bit. The second survey that's our annual uh, survey is the fall bottom trawl or the fall forage assessment as it's called uh, in some cases. And the forage assessment uh, has been going on since 1973. Uh, and it allows us to index uh, yearling and older alewife, bloater and rainbow smelt. Uh, so this is data that's paired and complementary to the hydroacoustic, um, as well as deep water and slimy sculpin uh, densities, nine spine stickleback, age zero perch and round goby. Uh, we also pick up other species and report out on those, such as burbot and lake trout. So this survey was completed in its entirety in September of 2023 uh, by the USGS. It consisted of 70 what we consider standard toes. This is area between 5 and 110 meters in depth. Um, we also added eight deep water toes. We've been adding these as we've been going through the last decade uh, to try to move out deeper into the water. Um, to try to see if fish, uh, in some cases, might have moved deeper in recent years, and also to compare to the spring data set that I'll talk about a little bit later today. Uh, during these uh, surveys, we kept actually 477 alewife for aging. Again, uh, that's actually why it's a little backed up. We've got a lot of fish to work through. Um, and just over here on the right, I thought it'd be nice to show, uh, you know, what my standard catch looks like uh, when I'm out there, which is a whole bunch of quagga mussels and a few alewife sprinkled in. So that's actually from uh, outside of Frankfurt that that photo was taken. So let's jump right into uh, some results and we'll start with the uh, most popular uh, species, uh, alewife. So if we look here, um, this is age zero alewife as estimated by the hydroacoustic survey. Um, we've got number per hectare on the y-axis and year on the x, as well as this distribution of sample of catch um, throughout, the lake, throughout Lake Michigan. Uh, and what we see here first off is that we had a relatively high index for age zero alewife life in 2023, about 10 and a half kilograms per hectare. Uh, so this is more than double the average value over this entire time series. What's particularly interesting is that most of these fish were caught outside of Sturgeon Bay and upwards of 20,000 fish per hectare estimated. Um, this is pretty unusual. When we look at previous years where we saw high uh, abundance estimates during the survey, 
2005, 2010, um, those numbers tended to max out around 5,000. Um, so what we're seeing here is a lot of fish caught in one area, where in previous layers, they were more spatially distributed throughout the lake. Um, so essentially what that does is, is kind of lower our confidence in that mean value, um, big old error bars associated with it, because most fish were caught in one area. Still, it does indicate a relatively high number of HL air life in the water. Moving on to yearling and older air life. Um, so here we have a similar plot, except we've included that data series uh, for the bottom trawl starting in 1973 all the way through 2023 in black, and then the acoustic survey shown in blue since 2004. Uh, so big take-homes right off is we saw a very large estimate of uh, yearling and older alewife in the hydroacoustic survey as well. Um, and this was actually about uh, 10 and a half. Sorry, the A0 index was over a thousand fish, so I apologize for that. Uh, but about 10 and a half kilograms per hectare from the hydroacoustic survey. And this is actually the highest value uh, that we've seen in the hydroacoustic survey since it was started in 2004. Uh, so we were a bit surprised to see these results. And we Note that the spatial distribution of the fish was largely along the western shoreline. So these were caught largely along Wisconsin uh, and down south into uh, Illinois. Um, now, as you might notice, our bottom trawl survey did not quite get to 10.5 kilograms per hectare. That estimate was 0 0.74, uh, which is quite a big discrepancy. Um, however, if we look at the spatial distribution, interestingly enough, the highest catches were again all along the western shoreline. And if we zoom in on that time series, starting in 2004 where we had both surveys, um, there's a couple interesting things to note. The first is that estimate of 0.74 is actually the highest we've observed since 2013 in the bottom trawl. Um, and that was a year where most of the fish came from one transect outside of Saugatuck. So again, that idea of high error bars or high low confidence in that number. Um, this year, we saw that 6% of our samples actually had more than five kilograms per hectare of ale life. And again, this is the highest number of toes with that uh, abundance of fish since 2013. So what we end up with, while well, the number looks relatively low, it's actually the highest we've seen in several years. Uh, and there's a lot more confidence around those values than similar values back in um, 2019 or 2018, um, where we had large error rates associated with those numbers. So fish were caught in one or two spots. So long story short is it appears that in both of our uh, estimates of yearling and older alewife, there is some notable increase from 2022 to 2023. Now we'll come back to the other point on this figure, which is, uh, for those of you familiar with the data set, this large discrepancy uh, between the bottom trawl and hydroacoustic estimates that we've seen in recent years. Um, but first, I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the other species that we index in both of these surveys. Uh, so next up, we have bloater, uh, less than 120 millimeters. So we commonly refer to these as small bloater. Um, but essentially, uh, they can allow from the hydroacoustic survey an index of recruitment strength for a given year. So we saw about an average year in 2023 uh, for small bloater in the hydroacoustic survey. I think it was about 142 fish per, uh, per hectare. Um, so this is actually representative of a relatively good recruitment event. Um, you would notice that the bottom trawl does not have the same uh, good news. It's actually close to about two fish per hectare. But this isn't uncommon to see this kind of discrepancy. So as we've seen in previous years, we see a peak in the hydroacoustic, and then the following year, a peak in the bottom trawl. And we think that's because in the bottom trawl, we might be indexing multiple year classes uh, with this less than 120 millimeter length. So you might be seeing these fish as they move from pelagic down to benthic showing up in the bottom trawl the following year of a high recruitment event. So right now we've actually got a team at the center who's taking years and years of, of bloater data and trying to age these fish that we have in our archives. So we're hoping to get this fine tuned so we can figure out exactly what we're seeing in the bottom trawl for these fish. Uh, regardless, it does seem that there was a, a recruitment event for uh, bloater uh, as indexed by the acoustic survey this year. For large bloater, are those fish greater than or equal to 120 millimeters? Um, both surveys were around uh, two and a half to three kilograms per hectare. Now, if you look at that in reference to the bottom trawl survey uh, in the 70s or the 80s and 90s, that seems quite low. Um, but if we actually zoom in on those numbers like we did before for alewife, we kind of see a different story. 
Uh, so in recent years, we've seen the building of biomass of large bloater in the lake. Uh, so coming out to about two to three kilograms per hectare in both surveys, uh, depending on the year. Um, so this represents a pretty substantial increase, especially for the acoustic survey, if you look back to 2004, where it was quite low. So given the high recruitment events in recent years or average in 2023, it does seem like we're building bloater biomass back in the lake. Uh, most of these fish were kind of sporadically caught throughout the lake, uh, but they did tend to be in the highest densities kind of in central Lake Michigan. Uh, moving on to another species of interest, rainbow smelt. Uh, we'll start with the small rainbow smelt, again, thinking about some kind of index of recruitment. Um, so this number was about uh, average for the uh, acoustic survey this year uh, and what we would consider indicative of a recruitment event. For the bottom trawl, it was, again, near zero. And this kind of is the fifth year where we've seen near zero values for a small rainbow smelt in that survey. Uh, but there does seem to be some indication of a recruitment event from the acoustic survey. Um, however, when you look at adults, things get a little more bleak if you're a fan of rainbow smelt. In fact, both surveys were close to zero uh, in 2023. So very, very few smelt caught that were larger or above uh, 90 millimeters. Um, so this essentially would suggest that there might be some sort of bottleneck occurring uh, for this species in the early part of its life. Uh, kind of like what we were talking about, or Paris was talking about with the CSMI data set. It's not uh, clear what that bottleneck is, but certainly fish are not getting to the adult stage. So I mentioned we also index other species with the uh, fall forage assessment, um, and this could include nine spine, spine, nine spine stickleback. Uh, I always screw that one up. Uh, rainbow around goby. Um, slimy sculpin and deep water sculpin, as well as some other species. But these, in addition to uh, ale life, rainbow smell, and bloater, make up what we consider the primary forage base in the lake. Um, so for those species, we actually saw little change from previous years. In fact, most of them stayed near historic lows. So again, this goes back to this idea. In recent years, we've seen low biomass of prey fish in the lake. Um, round goby was about 0 0.3 kilograms per hectare, which is actually quite a bit I think it was 1.6 in 2022, uh, quite a bit lower than the previous season. Uh, but overall, the clear message here is that in terms of overall biomass, uh, we're still quite lower than the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s for prey fish. I got a, uh, sure. I do a lot of snorkeling and diving and stuff, and um, I just wonder how would you, when the round gobies are just inundated around the rock pile, how would you? Your dredge, your yeah. fall, catch rocks. You know, how would you even know? Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? that's that's. They're in there by when you're not snorkeling around. You, they're they're skidding around in there just by the, you know, just all kinds of. Yeah, and you know that's that's a great question. We're going to come back to that a little bit later, but just to answer it now, when we talk about round goby density. Can you repeat yes. the question for the online audience real quick? Sure. It was just um, how can we say anything about round goby given they tend to be around rocky habitats skittering under rocks that would likely avoid our nets correct that was the question yeah yeah so essentially uh we're not confident in that number <laughs> we track it because we're out there sampling these sandy habitats and we do see an iso oscillating population is that actually oscillating or is it just that we don't have a good handle on that density estimate because of that variability associated with habitat bias um we're actually working on some other work with advanced technology at the center um, that essentially is trying to track and index these species in another way. And that works ongoing, and they'll be doing a survey later this year on Lake Michigan to, I think it's the fourth year in a row they'll be doing that. So they're using underwater vehicles, essentially to go over these rocky and sandy habitats to try to index uh, round goby. They call it a goby bot, so it's got a fun name. It's got more fun than my trawl names, so, uh, but great question. So uh, a general summary from the annual surveys, uh, the 2023 uh, alewife year class appears to be relatively strong, uh, but there is low statistical confidence around that number. So it might be needed to take, be taken with some precaution. Um, both annual surveys indicate some increase in yearling and older alewife biomass density from 22 uh, to 23, but to varying degrees. We saw that massive increase in the hydroacoustic survey and a small increase, um, albeit a greater distribution of the species in the bottom trail. So we continue to wonder 
why this large and uh, strong discrepancy between these two surveys that historically were aligned. We'll come back to that. Um, the acoustic survey also indicates that we had a better or close to average, I should say, bloater recruitment uh, in 2023. And we're still seeing that large bloater biomass continues to mean, may remain relatively high compared to earlier this uh, in the decades. And finally, biomass estimates for other forage fishes are really similar to what they were in recent years um, beyond the alewife and bloater estimates. So at that point, I'd like to come back to this idea of discrepancy between the hydroacoustic survey and the bottom trawl, the fall bottom trawl specifically. Um, so there's been a lot of work done recently or, or examination of existing data, testing ships, looking at noise bias, water clarity bias, changes in species composition to try to figure out what the heck happened, right? Um, and that nothing's been conclusive. So at around 2020, um, it was proposed that maybe something has happened in the fall that's just lowered our ability to catch these fish. Maybe alewife are using slightly different habitat. Maybe they're higher in the water column. Uh, but essentially, maybe something's going on with the catchability of these fish that's affecting our fall bottom trawl numbers. So it was then pitched uh, that we try to implement a, a spring bottom trawl survey uh, that might provide more comparable estimates of alewife densities uh, to the acoustic survey than the fall bottom trawl. And this idea actually comes out of Lake Ontario, where they use their spring bottom trawl uh, that's implemented over a large number of sites to estimate alewife biomass in the lake. And it's got a few benefits. Um, they tend to catch more yearling fish, which we know we miss in the bottom trawl survey in the fall. They're just not in the habitats we tend to sample. So we've always underestimated that number. Um, but additionally, because alewife tend to aggregate in deep waters during winter months uh, and don't come out until later in the spring as they get closer to spawn, um, we have the potential to target them during a spring survey at around 300 to 600 feet in depth, um, according to what they see on Lake Ontario, so maybe 150 meters. Um, so we are interested in implementing this and seeing, uh, do we actually see more uh, alignment between the spring survey and the acoustic survey than the acoustic in the fall? And could that explain some of the differences we've seen in recent years? Uh, so we first implemented this uh, in the spring of 2021. We started in mid-April, um, and this was actually uh, supposed to be a full survey, but it was shortened because of uh, COVID restrictions. So we chose to prioritize areas that we could get to quickly and get back quickly in case of a, a COVID outbreak or situation. Um, and we focused on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan, specifically Frankfurt, Ludington, and Saugatuck. Uh, we prioritized transects uh, that were between five and two... Uh, range from five to 225 meters in depth. So this actually takes our standard survey, which again is out to about 110 meters and extends it out to the habitat that we think alewife might be occupying in April. Um, so about 34% of our sites were those deep water sites that year. And we did a full spectrum of sampling at our standard locations uh, just to try to verify that this was actually occurring, this aggregation in deep waters. And in a nutshell, uh, what we saw is that alewife were aggregated in those deep water habitats. Uh, we saw very, very few, in fact, zero below 100 meters in depth that were captured across those three transects outside those ports. Uh, and then we saw a peaking of density estimates uh, at about 150 meters. So uh, essentially all three ports uh, saw their highest density estimates for alewife at those depths. And the highest number caught was around 24 kilograms per hectare, uh, and that was almost in the dead center between Saugatuck and Waukegan transects, so about 156 meters. Question? When you're taking these surveys, again, we're going back to diving. Yeah. The water temperature changes dramatically. Have you checked as you're doing this the difference in the water temperature when you're doing these tests? Yeah. To yeah. See where, what temperatures you're catching and mm -hmm. finding new things at? Yeah. So in the spring months, actually, on every cast or every tow that we do, we we throw out a cast of what's called a CTD. Essentially, it lets us monitor temperature down through the water all the way to the bottom of the, the, the lake. So we take a temperature profile at every site. In my, most cases, it's still isothermic. So we're still just seeing straight down or almost straight down at four degrees in April, especially in the north. Um, in one year, and we'll talk about that coming up here, um, things were starting to warm. That was 2023. Um, we had a really limited survey. We didn't get down to the south, but I think if we did, we might start to see that formation of a thermal bar in the shallower waters and some warming of the waters. 
Um, but in general, in April, our goal is to get out there when we haven't quite seen that shift in temperature to that level or extreme. So I've noticed that as we have been out there, the thermal climate has been changing a lot from year to year. Yeah. Finding more thermal climbs in different areas. I, I believe it, um, and especially with some of the stuff we've talked about earlier today, um, just the changes in water clarity, but also just this variability in temperature year to year. I mean, look what we're seeing now <laughs> in terms of this winter. So um, April is probably all 39 degrees. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is. And like I said, last year it warmed up faster. Um, we weren't able to get south, but we thought if we did it, we might see something different. So, so right now in the life cycle on Alway, according to your data, they're out there living straight off this port right now in Ludington. They will really be watered. Yeah. And then when do they inward migrate? Because there's a time in May and early June when they're in your harbor so thick that yeah. they just jump out all over the place yeah. and they're spawning. Do they, yeah. do they just come straight in to spawn or do they transect the coast or what do they, what do, they do? Yeah. So the question was related to when, when and where and how alewife are coming in after the outside in the winter. Yeah. Um, I don't have a clear answer to their movement patterns in terms of, of um, how their movement patterns occur, but clearly they're coming in to spawn likely in mid-May. mid, mid And folks in the room, you guys might know better than me, frankly, at, at your old individual ports that you might be most familiar with. Um, I even think early May on the Wisconsin side, I think in 2022, they did some skill netting uh, by the Wisconsin DNR that showed they were in earlier. Um, so I think it's anywhere, depending on the year, uh, either late April to, to June that those fish will right. be moving in. Right. Temperature dependent, yeah. So we've, we're have we really interested to see, especially this year, have these fish already moved in? Have, did they ever go as deep? Are they holding at slightly shallower temperatures or so, sh slightly shallower depths that are associated with maybe warmer temperatures? So. And it seems to correlate with, with the fish. I mean, when the allies are in, the, the salmon are not far behind and yeah. the browns are gorging on them. And, yeah, and just sort of, we see a lot of allies usually catch a lot of fish. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, Paris mentioned earlier um, that even the distribution in the lake when they see larvae emerging can differ quite a bit. So they were sampling in July and seeing high densities of alewife um, in the northern portion of the lake, but it seems like they actually missed the fish in the south and, and, and they were likely spawning earlier um, and they were already done and through and hatched by June. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of spatial variability now, there. Alewife spawn, I'm not an expert in the you are, but I mean, they don't like lay a nest. They don't they go into where the brackish water meets the thing and swirl around and have a big fish orgy. <laughs> it, 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 it happens right then when they're right in that brackish water and they're not yeah. doing beds and all that stuff right. like some people think. Right, yeah. So the question was, and uh, sorry for not repeating the last few questions. The, the question was related to how and where alewife were spawning. And yeah, I am also, believe it or not, not necessarily an alewife spawning expert. Uh, <laughs> but my my impression is they do come in and it's essentially a swarm uh, and they're spawning in these near shore waters. Yeah. Does the temperature and all of can affect from the algae standpoint of things? Does this affect the way that they, the LY are or are not coming in? I mean, we're seeing less of the algae than we have before. Is that a factor? So the question is that whether the alewife are, are affected by the uh, algae densities and when they might move in or not move in. And I, I don't know that the answer to that question. Um, I don't really have a good handle on it to tell you the truth. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> These are really great questions though. Um, yeah, so so we did this in 2021. We saw the trends we thought we might see uh, where these fish are still out deep, even into very early May. Um, we also saw something else of interest and, and that was that this is a catch at age, uh, catch at length plot here. We have proportion of total catch on the Y axis and length of fish on the, the X and then the different colors are age classes. So in 2021, we saw most of our fish were actually yearlings. Uh, from 2020, about 85% of our catch. Um, this was really interesting because, again, we don't normally get those fish in the fall survey. Usually we miss them. Um, so this is essentially what they say in Lake Ontario. As you get out there in the spring, you might have a good index of these yearling fish. So we were excited. 
you know, we got out there, we got some alewife, we had a really high density toe. Um, so we thought this might be a good answer. So uh, we didn't have enough data to really make a good comparison to the fall that year. As you saw earlier on the alewife uh, density maps, they can be anywhere distributed in, in ways you wouldn't necessarily understand. So uh, we couldn't make a direct comparison to the fall that year, but we were able to get out there in, in 2022. Um, and so in 2022, we actually expanded this to a full six port survey. So trying to get to both sides of the lakes in this early spring period, starting in mid April. Um, we put a greater focus on those deeper waters. So greater than 125 meters. We essentially did a 50 50 split between our standard site shallower and these new deep water sites. And that included trying to go all the way across the lake uh, in the north and the south. And uh, by some miracle, we were actually able to do that. Uh, I figured we'd be blown off the water too much to do it, but we were able to sample all the way across the lake in the south and the north between Sturgeon Bay and Frankfurt. Um, my crew wasn't necessarily happy. We had a good amount of snow, but they're troopers. So um, we are also able to sample several of these deep water sites that fall. So I mentioned earlier, we've been expanding what we're sampling in the fall, getting into deeper waters, and that allowed us to actually make some better comparisons statistically to what we were seeing in the spring. Uh, big story again, alewife were still aggregated in those deep waters in 2022. And here we've just got an actual uh, comparison between the probability of catching alewife at a certain depth between the spring and the fall as we were able to get that full survey. Um, so essentially your highest chance in the spring is that, that 150 meter in depth, maybe 125 to 175. In the fall, they're pretty well dispersed throughout. Um, so it's a pretty much a random chance whether you're getting them depending on where you are. So again, just reiterating that we did see the fish where we thought we would catch them. We also saw, again, our highest catches in the central, central portion of Southern Lake Michigan, although about half the number we saw in that large catch uh, in 2021. So as I mentioned, uh, one of the benefits here in 2022 is we were able to do an actual comparison uh, to the fall survey with the full extent of the lake. Uh, so here we've got kilograms per hectare of alewife, and that's all alewife, so yearling and older, and the number per hectare for the spring bottom trawl, the acoustic survey, and the fall bottom trawl of 2022. So uh, we did see higher numbers, 0.38 in the kilograms per hectare in the spring versus 0.1 in the fall. Uh, that's not exactly what we were expecting, because if you look at the acoustic survey, that estimate was an order of magnitude higher at 3.0. So even though we were able to complete this full survey, we didn't see the increase in alewife we might anticipate in the spring um, if we had been missing them in the fall survey. Uh, when you look at number per hectare, it's slightly different, right? We're about 10 times higher in the spring than the fall, but still four times lower than it was caught in the acoustic survey. Um, and the reason for this is, again, yearling fish and age two fish up made up the majority of the catch. It was about, again, 85%, or 80 to 85% that were yearling fish that 2021 year class. Um, so 2022 did show us, uh, kind of indicate to us that we got, we seem to understand what's going on with these fish in this time of the year, but we didn't see the change in biomass density we thought we would uh, from the fall survey. So our goal last year was to get out one more time at least and see if these results are consistent through the whole lake. Unfortunately, uh, the vessel had other ideas. Uh, we had some mechanical issues and staffing issues that really prevented us from doing a full survey. We still wanted to get out on the water and get some work done and potentially answer some interesting questions. Um, so we did a shortened survey at Sturgeon Bay, Frankfurt, and Ludington, the closest sites we could get to over a six-day period, so a really small period of time. But just in addition to sampling for alewife at these depths, uh, we wanted to answer an additional question or at least explore it. And this kind of relates to this idea that we didn't see the big biomass density estimate we might have anticipated between the spring and the fall in 2022. So the next question is, are we still missing these fish somehow? Um, so one idea that folks have pointed out um, at last year, some of our meetings last year with the Lake Committee, um, was is there any evidence that alewife are actually above the net, like just above our gear, and we're not able to catch them? Um, so this year we actually did something uh, we haven't done before, which is we paired mm -hmm. acoustic data with the bottom trawls. We'd go out and we'd uh, run over the area we do the bottom trawl for about 30 minutes, uh, so actually quite a bit more distance than where we actually bottom trawl. Then we drop the bottom trawl and run it. And what this allowed us to do is just make some general comparisons between uh, the acoustic estimates, like we were showing earlier here today, um, and the numbers that are coming up in the bottom trawl. So what'd you find? Well, here we go. <laughs> uh, first off, 
Uh, alewife were still out deep, but they were slightly shallower. Um, they were peaking out around 91 to 110 meters in depth. All this conversation we've been having about temperature differences, uh, we initially thought, well, it could be a little bit warmer. These fish might be shallower, and we did see that, but the temperature profiles weren't any different. It was still 39 straight to bottom at all these sites. So that was somewhat surprising, uh, but it was a warmer year and they were a little shallower. So there might be something there, but we didn't have a lot of sites. Um, also, there was really no indication that we were missing large numbers of fish um, sampling with the bottom trawl. And by that, I mean, uh, there were no bait balls in the acoustic survey. Um, we did those kilogram per hectare estimates and where we had enough data, and again, this was really relatively limited, there was no difference. Um, in some cases, it was close to the same kilograms per hectare throughout the entire water column as the bottom trawl, but even that sort of change wouldn't affect the numbers to a level that would, would account for that difference with the acoustic survey. Um, again, this was a relatively limited survey, so we're looking at the possibility of trying to expand this and do this again in, recent, in upcoming years. Yeah. Last year, the year before, one of the guys that just got brought in the water for a year early, there was a couple of charter captains as well. Yeah. And they were out on the shelf, like 100, 110 feet of water. Okay. Took some lake chart on the bottom, they were full of elements. And this was like late March or April. Really? Where was that? Out of Manistee. Really? Yeah. yeah. And the last two years, prior the 10 years prior to 22, I was catching anywhere between two or three hundred lake trout in the spring. And that was about it. You know, I'm just like yeah. a few browns. But two years ago and last year as well, there was enough bait out on the shelf. The lake trout did not come into the harbor in the numbers that they had been. We suddenly had brown trout to catch because the lake trout weren't in there eating the fries that were being planted for the juveniles that were being planted. Yeah. So there's obviously enough alewives in 100 feet of water the yeah. last two years anyway to feed the lake trout and keep them out of deep water. Mm -hmm. I swim all the way in here if you can stay home and eat. Sure. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah. And, and, and again, this idea of distributions of fish in the spring, even yeah. in March, um, it's one of the reasons we're so interested to get out there again this year. Like with this really abnormal year. What's that? Put my boat in the water today. Oh, did you? Well, there you go. <laughs> You're better than us. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, now, interestingly enough, you know, if we if we take one more look at this uh uh essentially prop prop uh proportion of total catch given a length and a given age. Um remember the last two years, 2021, 2022, was all yearling fish. And in 2023. It was age two. It was 2021 fish year class coming through. Um, so this was pretty interesting as well. This is again, a year class that's sometimes underestimated in the fall, and we're still catching high numbers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have the age composition data yet for uh, 2021 or 2023 from the acoustic or the fall bottom trawl, but signs are pointing to the idea that the 2021 class is well represented. Um, so maybe some of that change in biomass this last year is due to the, maybe a strong year class coming out of the spring or 2021 that we we're able to see here in the spring. Again, this is a very limited number of data, so we're looking forward to seeing that age comp data uh, to kind of understand those biomass density numbers a little bit more from our standard surveys. Uh, so just summarizing, uh, you know, what have we really learned in three years? Well, you might have picked up on this now, but alewife are aggregated uh, in deep water and are overwintering at least in April. Um, and we sampled into early May and we really haven't seen any change. Um, we appear to be able to catch yearling and age two alewife better in the spring uh, than we do in our fall surveys. And this aligns with what we know or what we think we know in Lake Ontario. Uh, however, in the only lake-wide survey to date, 2022, spring yearling and older alewife biomass density was higher than the fall, but not to account for that historical discrepancy we've seen since 2014 between our standard surveys. So we still think there's a bit to learn there. So moving into 2024, um, our field season plans are first, implement the spring bottom trawl again, six point survey, a full survey. Um, we pushed up the start date to April 9th, which is the earliest I could do. Um, just tried to get out there as quick as we can, because if you guys like to ice fish like me, this has been an awful winter for it. So uh, they, they're just, a, just got a little ice in Sheboygan before we can get moving and test our new transmission. Um, so this again is at least a little bit earlier than previous seasons. Um, we also plan to complete the full acoustic survey and that fall bottom trawl, um, and we've got the crew to do it. Uh, and finally, uh, we're focusing on completing a lake-wide uh, round goby survey uh, with, again, the goby bot that we talked about earlier. 
Um, this is led by Pete Esselman, uh, who works at the Great Lakes Science Center. Um, and he's presented on these data multiple times, at least the idea of it. Um, but now he's actually generating some numbers. So in the next couple of weeks, he should get some uh, GOBI biomass density estimates that might be more reflective of actually what's in the water, at least relative to other uh, bait fish or prey fish that are out there. Uh, with that, I, I'd just like to say thank you to all the crew, uh, the boat crew, the science crew that make these surveys possible. Uh, they're an incredible group. So, yeah, Mark. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, you didn't talk much about smell, and I think most of that was because you didn't catch many of them. Yeah. I will say that the last couple of years, anecdotally, the reports of, of smell dipping like it's actually viable again in the yeah. part of the state. Yeah. Whereas for most of my career, they, they, it has not been effective. They just weren't there. So anecdotally, there are more adult smell around to the point where people are dipping them yeah. and, and uh, catching them off the ears too with the, the, the real nets. That's a great point. Yeah. I actually remember being here in Ludington last spring and talking to some folks that were out there dip netting. And I said, we, we haven't been able to do this in years. And, and in Ludington, right? Uh, and it was a big, big event. So actually, I was excited to get out there and see what the fall showed and then completely bummed out to see his estimate of zero. So, um, you know, it's a single season. Maybe in the next couple of years, we'll start to see that biomass build up. So the question is, uh, in spring, when mature alewife migrate from winter deep water to shore and to spawn, uh, is there a guess as to why they end up where they do? Homing instincts, riding the currents. Also, uh, what is assumed to be, what is assumed about non-mature ill life migration in the spring? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I know there's some ongoing work, I think by Thomas Hook and one of his grad students, uh, specifically thinking about ill life migration and, and sources of ill life, drowned river mouths versus main basin. Um, in terms of homing for this species, I don't know a lot about it, to tell you the truth. Um, my thought is they'd come in and find a good spawning area and go, go for it. Um, but I don't have a a great understanding of that. Um, it's an excellent question. There might be other folks that can answer it a little bit better than me. So, any other thoughts? <laughs> you know, in Manistee, when we have a spring with a lot of east wind, we have much better spawning in Wisconsin than we always. Sure. They don't seem to want to swim back over the others. They Just get blown under the west shore. That's where we spawn. Yeah. It seems like anyway to us. Yeah, so the, the point that was made uh, was just that it seems like fish could be pushed uh, due to winds, prevailing winds in the spring, and potentially spawn in areas based on those winds, uh, which is a great point. Is Jay, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I remember we've talked about this previously, just prevailing winds in the spring, moving air life around. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it certainly can be, um, especially currents that are happening out there. They could, currents are wicked out there, and they could move fish in a hurry. So. Yeah. I would certainly look at that. And I think there are some folks looking at currents and movement of fish and water of fish and where they end up yeah. um, in the summer. So, yeah, that's all plausible. Right. And, and I think that Sturgeon Bay, I mean, here it is. It's, it's right adjacent to the huge abyss in the lake, the deepest part. And I fished out of Sturgeon Bay several tournaments, and it's just a whole different deal over there. You'll leave like our side of the lake, it'll be gin clear, be this and that. You go over there, it's like brackish water. It's just a whole different structure of the you know, it's got full rushes and stuff. It, it's just it, it, it's just yeah, it's a whole different feel when you go to Wisconsin. But at least I've been to Surgeon Bay four times and I just got a feel it's just a different fishery. Mm. And, and you see their catches for browns and stuff. It's like yeah, you know, and then they have that prevailing west wind all the time, so they get upwelling. And when we went over there to fish tournaments, he said we're going to go to eight or ten miles offshore. They were like, "Why don't we never do that?" You know, <laughs> because he's they had such a good fishery all the time because of the upwelling. They most of the people we talked to never got, had to go three or four miles offshore because they had beautiful cold water close to shore almost all summer long. Yeah, so it was really nice for the small boat fishery because. They had it was it was just on all the time. Yeah. Where we, you know, we're like, oh, aren't you going to go 10, 15 miles off to get steel? And they're like, yeah, we've never done that. You know, and so it's it, it's just sort of a whole different deal over there with that with that Sturgeon Bay so huge pouring out into Lake Michigan. Yeah, it's just 
Yeah, what's surprising to me is that I, I looked, I saw those numbers this year outside of Surgeon Bay for the age zero oil life. Yeah. So we went, I looked back on all the other transects we've done since 2004. And it's really never been like that, where you've got this big pulse outside of Sturgeon Bay. It's really when, we, when we've had big years, it's spread throughout the lake or it's in the southern portion of the lake. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was so I had kind of the same thought. And then I went back and looked at the data on it. There wasn't a trend that would suggest that's a high. It doesn't Sturgeon Bay, as big as it is, it doesn't have like a salmon run. Does It's like a, <laughs> they don't have a good tributaries that go in there. That, I mean, don't they, when they plant their salmon, they don't have like a river they swim up to to spawn and reproduce, do they? I think it's just. I think others folks might know better than me on I, that I part. I think they do. What kind of temperature? Well, I mean, just when we fished their tournament, it was in like okay. third week of July. Sorry about that. No, no, third week, of, second week of August. And it was just like, they, you just didn't have to go far because the, 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 the